to Shelter Cove Online. We're so glad that you're tuning in with us today for this sermon, continuing our series of celebrating faithfulness and the life of Joseph. Pastor Ed's bringing the word today. It's an incredible one. I truly hope that this encourages you, uh, that you learn something, that God reveals more of himself to you today through this message. If you would like to respond in any way, you can contact us at 209-340-3115. Send us a text at that number, or you can go to sheltercovelive.com. We hope that you enjoy the message and have a great rest of your day. 1977, uh, I was 17 years old, and folks, I was on top of the world. I had a 1967 Mustang. Can I hear an amen on that? I feel sorry for you Camaro people. Anyway, uh, I had a 67 Mustang, uh, 3.93 GPA, four-letter sports person. I was on top of the world. I was dating a young lady by the name of Colleen DeCue. She uh, lived not too far from me. She was in my typing class. We had typing back then, for those of you younger people. Uh, it actually had an IBM Selectric. Now, that'll go back some years. Anyway, uh, um, we got really, really close for about three months. We were dating, etc. And then one night in the winter of 1977-78, she gave me a nine-page Dear Ed letter. <laughs> now, gentlemen, nine pages. <laughs> that was painful. Through a lot of tears and most of the night, uh, she just said these words. She said, uh, we're getting too close. And I'm a Christian, and you're clearly not. Now, on our very first date, she told me she was a Christian, and she expected to be uh, doing our dating relationship in a Christian way. And I said, well, I'm a Christian too. And I pulled out a necklace that had my Catholic grandmother had given me. It was a St. Christopher. Now, if you know what that is, it has nothing to do with anything, but I thought, hey, <laughs> I'm a Christian. I, I have some stuff. Her father would not shake my hand when I first met him because he knew who I was. My reputation had uh, went ahead of me. But in that nine-page Dear Ed letter, she explained the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on December 3rd, 1977, at 1023 North Pearl Street, in Centralia, Washington, 10 p.m., uh, this poor sport letterman knelt down beside his bed after reading the first six chapters of Matthew from a King James little New Testament that I kept at my bedside that I'd never opened before, that my grandmother gave me when I was five, and I turned my life over to Christ. Now listen, the idea of our particular message today is that a changed heart is a powerful thing. God had been leading me up until that moment. I'd even went to hit her youth group, which was the lamest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Some knucklehead with a guitar singing Kumbaya over and over. I, I, it, awful. And yet I met this youth pastor. His name was Mike Bowers, and he invited a bunch of us to come over to his house and watch this made-for-TV movie called Jesus of Nazareth. They offered popcorn, so I went. And so I listened to this, this movie for two and a half hours, and this guy, this youth pastor guy, was looking at his Bible every time some scene changed, and he'd flip over, and he'd try to make sure they were doing it right. And when they got it wrong, he'd go, whoa, 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 look at this, that's not right. And he would read the text, and he was right. The Bible said something different. And I thought, whoa, that is commitment to something I didn't get. You see, God was preparing to change my heart. And then I had a high school basketball coach who was a legend in my town. Uh, I don't know exactly how many years, but I think it was something like 48 years of being the, the coach there. And he took me under his wing and told me and taught me what was right and what was wrong. Found out later he went to a little Presbyterian church in town. But you see, my mother had been married five times before I was 17. And I'd seen every kind of stepfather there was, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to quote Clint Eastwood. And the bottom line is, is that this basketball coach showed me things. A changed heart is a powerful thing, and God changes heart, and sometimes he uses circumstances to do it in powerful ways. 
And as 35 years of doing what I do, I can tell you now I've ran into a lot of changed hearts. Chief of on my mind is in 1999, I met Chris. And Chris was a six foot four, 240 pound powerhouse of a man. His biceps were bigger than my thighs. He came into the church on a motorcycle with leathers, big Fu Manchu mustache, sunglasses, bald head, and a, a do rag uh, that was over the top of that bald head. And he just came in and he said, I need help because I have two uh, children, two girls, seven and nine, and I don't know exactly what to do. The mother had gone off and was a drug addict, and he didn't want her, them near her. And, and all of our staff at Christ Church up in Seattle was scared. As, <laughs> this guy scared them. And rightfully so. He's the scariest guy I know. He's a truck driver now. I, I, I met him last year up in Ripon at the truck stop there just to have a cup of coffee and find out how he's doing. So don't cross me, people. I know people. <laughs> you will disappear. <laughs> No, I mean, he'd been in and out of jail got, uh, for beating up his ex-wife's girl, uh, boyfriend, uh, got kicked out of the army for knocking out a staff sergeant in some drill. So I met with him every month, three or four weeks or so, give or take, every three or four weeks at Red Robin, and I found out he was a movie buff, and I said, I'm a movie buff, and we went and watched movies, and over dinner, we talked about how to raise a seven- and nine-year-old girl as a guy like that. A changed heart is a powerful thing. This study today is like no other sermon I've ever given. It's not typical. Because it's basically a story that spans three chapters of the scripture. Genesis 42, 43, and 44. You can read most of 43 and 44 after this. We're gonna focus on 42. But if you have a Bible on your phone or on your iPad or a regular Bible you've brought, go ahead and pull that out, Genesis 42. If you don't have a Bible, you're going to need one, so the ushers have them. Just raise your hand, take one for now. You can borrow it. Uh, they're over here. They're over there. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can keep that uh, uh, for us. Uh, we'll just give that to you. But we're just going to uh, read through the text because the text speaks for itself. I'm just going to make a couple observations, but this isn't going to be the typical thing. Parts of me feels like we could just read the story and be good, because it's such a powerful, powerful story. For those of you who have to take notes, I did put three of them on your little piece of paper thingy, or what we call the gathering card, and if you want to write this down, you're welcome to. What we're going to observe here is this. First, we're going to see that guilt is awful. Guilt is awful. Secondly, we're going to see that forgiveness is beautiful. Forgiveness is beautiful. And thirdly, we're going to see that character is priceless. Guilt is awful. Forgiveness is beautiful. Character is priceless. Let me set the story. So the impact of a famine going on in Israel causes Jacob, in chapter 42, to send his sons to Egypt now, you've got to realize this is 20 years after the story that Chad uh, taught about a couple weeks ago. In other words, Joseph has been sold into slavery for dead 20 years ago. And old Jacob has got this famine going on, and he's got to have some food for his family and his loved ones. And so he sends his other 10 sons away because he keeps Benjamin behind. He's lost Joseph, his favorite and he's not going to lose Benjamin, his now new favorite, and he holds him back, but he sends the other ones over to Egypt. Now, the, the brothers cannot possibly know that Joseph has been rescued from that Midian uh, slavery thing that they sold him into, thinking that would kill him, because they didn't want the blood of the, the brother on their hands, so they sold him to some people who they were sure were going to kill him, which would be the natural thing, work him to death, literally. So when the brothers arrive in, in, in Egypt, they have no idea that Joseph is now second in charge of all of Pharaoh's lands. So as we look through uh, Genesis 42, let me just start with this whole concept of guilt is evil. So now you get the story. They're coming in. They are at the throne room, if you will, of the Egyptian palace, and they're meeting Joseph, though they don't know it. Verse 8. So turn over to verse 8. 
There's too many texts. I'm not going to put them on the screen. It, it, it just roll forever. Verse 8, although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies you have come to see where our land is unprotected. Verse 10, no, my Lord, they answered, your servants have come to buy food. We are all of the sons of one man. Now catch this next phrase. If you have your own Bible, you should underline this because he, they lie in their teeth. Your servants are honest men, not spies. Well, there's two phrases there, but one is true, one is not. The spy thing, they're not spies. Honest men, they're not that either. Because for 20 years, they've been lying to Jacob about that other brother and what had happened. They just said, oh, gee whiz, he's lost in the desert. He got captured. He's, he's somewhere else. But they didn't talk about their own implicit behavior with Joseph. For those of you taking notes, here's the thing. Guilt causes you to hide facts. The fact is, these guys had, in fact, killed or tried to kill their brother. And take note that guilt lasts a long time. Honest men? No, they're not honest men. They lied to their father for 20 years, and it's been on their mind for a long time. In fact, 20 years, so much so that even now they can't admit it to themselves. Secondly, guilt causes you to fool yourself. Take a look at verse 13. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and catch this, another underlined part, and one is no more. Now, I'm just telling you now that when you have guilt, a lot of times you literally fool yourself, hide the facts, and you don't tell the whole truth. How many of you guys have kids? Okay. My oldest, Sarah, is a terrific lady. She's 35 now. In fact, a, a lady came up to me right before the service and told me that she had met Sarah online this week because she's one of these, quote, influencers. She's got something like 150,000 people following her on TikTok and stuff like that. Very solid Christian gal. But when she was 14, and you can record this, <laughs> she was the master at hiding the truth. She would only tell enough of the truth to think like she assaged her conscience to say that she did tell the truth. Hey, Eddie's down here on the ground bleeding. What happened? Uh, he fell, Dad. How did he fall? And then my other younger son was saying, she pushed him. In other words, she would never, ever tell the full truth. These guys are not telling the truth, folks. It's part of human nature. Look at 14, verse 14. But Joseph said to them, it is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. Joseph says, hey, I'm going to test their character right now. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place until your youngest brother comes here. Verse 16. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you all remain confined that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you. Folks, he knew that guilt was sitting on the top of their mind. He wanted to test their honesty, their sincerity. And so he locks them up for three days as you read on. He wants them to think about this. And as you go on, I believe that Joseph changes his mind and he does something a little bit different in verse 19. But don't forget, I'm going to remind you, that living with guilt is just awful. It's constantly reminding you of unrepentant sin. I had a guy in between the two services come up to me, and he just started talking, and he just broke down. He's about my age. He said he hasn't talked to his sister for a year. Some, something, some death had happened a year ago, and she didn't come to something uh, that he thought she should, and, and he just, and I told him, listen, you can't allow that to continue because guilt is awful. It's awful. Verse 19, 
Joseph's new deal. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of the households. In other words, take care of the famine part. And bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die as spies. And they did so. Verse 21, catch this. Then they said to one another, quote, in truth we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us while he was in that well, if you remember, and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us, unquote. Folks, guilt follows you for the rest of your life if you allow it. When we're done with this, I am hoping that you will come to some freedom over anything that is in your past because by when we get to the character is priceless part, this story will set you free. Now look at Reuben's answer, verse 22. Now Reuben is the guy that always says, I told you so. You ever know anybody like that? Totally irritating, don't you think? And Reuben answered them in verse 22. Now this is after they all confessed that, man, this, this is all about that thing that happened 20 years ago. Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. You see, everything that goes on in their life from that point forward is all about guilt. Verse 23, they did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. In other words, Joseph was considered to be an Egyptian. Egyptians don't speak Hebrew, and they're talking in Hebrew, and he's, they're thinking they can just talk. Plus, they don't know it's Joseph. But Joseph knows. Now, look at this, verse 24, key, key verse, underline. Then he turned away from them and wept. Folks, Joseph has come to a forgiveness point in his life with those guys, and he's just seeing about how the guilt has affected them. I, it's not in the text, but I'm pretty sure that what is going on here is that they're all in front of him, and they're talking, and I'm pretty sure that they're crestfallen. They recognize what Reuben has just said, that this guilt thing had really hammered them. And I believe that there's a lot more that's going on here than just what is quoted because Joseph turns away from them and weeps. And he returned to them and spoke to them, and he took Simeon from them, this is all in verse 24, and bound him before their eyes, in other words, put him in chains. And verse 25, and Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, now note this, and to replace every, mon every man's money in his sack and give them provisions for the journey back. Guilt is awful, forgiveness is beautiful. Joseph steps in and says, I'm going to start with giving you back the silver you came to buy the grain with. It's, an, it's a, uh, just a hint of forgiveness on Joseph's part. And I love how Joseph knew what was being said, and he gives their money back as a token of surety in his own heart and I've forgiven those guys. Now that guy this morning about the sister, he said he tried to reach out to him twice in the last year, and she said, no, I don't want to talk to you. But then he said, and he turned to me, now he's crying out here in the lobby. He says, but I've never forgiven her. So you can pray for him tonight. Because I told him tonight, you should go kneel down by your bed or in your kitchen or somewhere, and ask the Lord of forgiveness to give you the compassion that he's given you as a Christian. Now, if you're a Christian in there, here, you know how much you've been forgiven, right? Is it not immeasurable? Is it not phenomenal? And my Bible says that forgiveness means that we forgive easily to other people even when they do dumb things to us. And I can tell you, after five stepfathers and my own father being a complete alcoholic, that I have a lot to forgive of others. But it's only through the Spirit that I can do that. You follow? I'm telling you now, bitterness will kill you. It's a cancer. And here we have forgiveness beginning in this story, and it's beautiful in my opinion. Now, forgiveness is an interesting thing 
What drives it? Because I don't think it's natural. I really don't. But in Ephesians 4.32, it says, quote, Paul says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Now, I've been forgiven a lot, folks. We could spend all day here and we could list it. You know, in heaven, when you go to the beam of seat and they show you all the things you've ever done in your life and Jesus stands up, hey, I've paid for that. I don't know about you, but that is not something I'm looking forward to. Except for the fact that I have a great advocate in Jesus and it'll be paid for. Here, in Ephesians 4, it says the same thing that Jesus says in Matthew 6, 14, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Paul says, Colossians 3, 13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, as a youth pastor, some kid would come in and say, oh, yeah, my parents are really bad, blah, blah, blah. I go, oh, yeah, what's going on? And they'd tell me some story, and I'd go, "Uh uh-huh. Well, let me just tell you a few stories. And I guarantee you that my stories trump yours, pal. So if you can forgive someone, I'm telling you, if I can do it, you can do it. And when, when in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, he, Jesus says strictly, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. That's a powerful thing. And in my opinion, it's beautiful. And I know, <laughs> after 35 years of doing this, I know the damage people can do to others. I understand the darkness sometimes. And I know sometimes you have to put boundaries around. You can forgive, but there are times when you just cannot be around those people. But I know this, that forgiveness is freeing to the soul. And I understand how some people can be so mean damaging, evil even. But my Bible says that you and I are to be people of forgiveness, to give it and receive it easily. Verse 26, we pick up the storyline again. And then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, halfway point, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. And he says to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is. At this, their hearts failed them, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is it that God has done to us? Folks, they're still seeing this whole thing through guilt. They don't see it as as a blessing. They're seeing it as guilt. And they really, literally can't get through it. Now, most of you know I'm a reader. I love books. There's one book that I believe every single person that deals with unforgiveness or forgiveness or just wants to be inspired, you should be on your bucket list. It's called The Hiding Place. It's written by a lady that I've never met but I respect deeply. Her name is Corey Ten Boom. Now, most of you probably don't even know who that is, but she was a lady that hid people from the Nazis in World War II. She ends up in a concentration camp along with her family. Her family, most of them die. Her sister is in the same camp as she is in a different barrack, right next to each other, but separated. And the the girl, the sister, who's very beautiful, is consistently sexually assaulted night after night by the Nazi guards, ultimately killing her. And... Corey Timboom talks about the cries that she recognized from her sister and she could do nothing about it in the middle of the night. 1948 comes along and she's doing a presentation at a church about forgiveness and she alter calls for the crowd to say, hey, if you need forgiveness, come forward. And this guy comes forward down the aisle and it turns out to be the Nazi guard that ended up killing the sister. And with tears in his eyes at the altar, he just says, ma'am, I don't even know how to ask for forgiveness. And I wrote it down. Corey Boom, Ten Boom said this. Well, Jesus forgives you, and so do I. 
And I know people can do icky things, but I believe God prepares hearts so that he can, in fact, build character, not perfection. Christians are not perfect. Not even pastors, except for JT. But the bottom line is we're not perfect. But I believe God takes those guilty things which sometimes are right to convict us and then when forgiveness comes from the power of Jesus or through a person or a a circumstance, then I believe character is built and I am here to tell you folks, character is priceless. You can't buy it. Verse 35 you see, if you look at verse 35 and 36, you'll see that they're frightened because everybody sees that they have their money back. And they think they're gonna get accused by Pharaoh of stealing. And they are fearful. And remember, they're still thinking this is all happening because of their mess with Joseph 20 years before. And then Reuben says this, because Jacob doesn't wanna go along with this. Jacob says, hey, you're not taking Benjamin. You lost Joseph. Now I'm losing Simeon. No way are you taking Benjamin. Here's Reuben's statement in verse 37, because I think Reuben is repenting right here before our very eyes. Verse 37, then Reuben said to his father, kill my two sons. If I do not bring him back to you, put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. Reuben is repenting. In a Catholic sense, if you're a Catholic background, it's almost like penance. His character is starting to change for the good. And folks, I'm here to tell you that if you have guilt in your life, it is wiped away by Jesus' blood. Period. And some of us, in fact, most Christians, take their burdens, their guilt, their sin, their shame, whatever, and they come over to the cross and they lay it down and they say, please forgive me. And they think, oh, yay. And they feel pretty good about that. And yay. And, and Jesus takes care of it. And then they walk away and then they, ah. Oh, And they grab the guilt and the burden right back and they put it back on their shoulders because they're used to carrying it. Folks, I'm telling you, here's, here's my one and only word of demand. Stop it. Stop carrying guilt that has already been forgiven by the cross. Start living your life without that nonsense. Some of you have been through lousy divorces. Some of you have been through kids that have been estranged. Some of you have been hurt by somebody that's close to you. How many of you guys have been hurt? Raise your hand. Okay, those of you who didn't, you're lying. So that's the bottom line. Bob Irwin has a counseling thing you might want to. Anyway, the bottom line is that we've all been hurt, and if you haven't been hurt, you will be. But when you take your own failties, your own stupidities, which we all sometimes do, all of us, and we put it at the cross, will you please just leave it there? Jesus says that God sees your sin no more and he sends it east to west to be forgotten. Philippians 3.13, it says, forget what is behind me and I press forward to what Christ Jesus is calling me heavenward for. Folks, we don't need any more Christians in this world living a guilty life. Because if you do, it will color everything around you. And I'm getting sick and tired of this world and some of the idiotic choices that people are making. And it's time that you and I as Christians really believe that the blood of Jesus is effective. 43, chapter 43, verse 6. Israel asked, why did you bring the Israel's Jacob, by the way, This is verse six. Why did you bring this trouble on me by telling the man you had another brother? And they replied, listen, I'm just answering the questions. You can see that in verse seven. Verse eight, then Judah said, now Judah is the the, kind of the ringleader of the Joseph story 20 years ago. He's the one that kind of led the whole charge, but now he's repenting. Jesus, then Judah, verse eight rather, said to Israel, his father, Send the boy along with me and we will go at once so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. Folks, when we repent of guilt and we say, okay, enough of that, we are personally responsible. That's why I believe that you need a personal relationship with Christ. Can't be just some, you know, 
thing you just sort of do. It's a personal thing that change has begun and character changes. And as you look at verse 19 all the way through 23, you see the story as you see character change. And it's my contention that good character shows itself for God's glory. Not perfection, just good character. Here's the thing I used to say all the time to every staff person I knew and every student I ever worked with. It's this. Always do what's right because it's right. No other reason. You follow that? And what is right is if you've got something held against somebody else, is that you've got to ask the Lord to give you the power and the peace and the strength to forgive that person and then let them know. Now, my Bible says that as far as it is up to us, we are to live at peace with all men. Now, if they don't want to accept your apology or whatever, okay. Or if, they don't, if they're not sorry about the thing that they're attacking you about a long time ago, okay. But as far as me and my house, I'm going to follow the Lord. And my Lord says, forgive as God has forgiven us. And that's a win. Folks, that's all I got to say. That's it. Guilt, awful way to live. Forgiveness, beautiful when you see it. And character is priceless as it's developed. We're going to have baptism here. There's a couple of people who want to be baptized. And if you want to be baptized, I know you're maybe not prepared, but that's okay. We baptize people in their street clothes all the time around here. We got towels and everything. You even get a t-shirt. But the bottom line is, you're welcome to do that. Baptism is kind of a step of character, isn't it? It's where we show that, hey, listen, I am sick and tired of my guilt. It's all over. The, the Lord has cleansed me. It's washed me. It's kind of like the water. And I've accepted the beautiful forgiveness that God has to offer. Scott, you can come on up. I'm going to turn this over to Scott, and we're going to do the baptism. But I want to leave you with this one song. It's an old one. And for those of you who don't know who Phillips, Craig, and Dean is, you should look that up. Right in the middle of their, their famous song, it says this. Once there was a broken heart. Way too human from the start, and all the years left it torn apart, hopeless and afraid. Walls I never meant to build left this prisoner unfulfilled, freedom called out, but even still it seemed so far away. I was bound by the chains from the wages of my sin. Just when I felt like giving in, mercy came running. Like a prisoner set free, past all my failures to the point of my need, when the sin that I carried was all I could see, and when I could not reach mercy, mercy came running to me. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. And Father, where some of these folks need to come running to you, may it be so. And where you need to reach out to them right where they're sitting, may that be so. At the end of the day, Lord, we want Jesus' blood to mean something big. And forgiveness is so beautiful, so powerful. Help it change our character, even in this moment in time. And may you be with these baptisms, these testimonies of your change, of the guilt washing away, of the blood, well, the blood of forgiveness affecting a soul. We love you in the name of Jesus. Amen.